Okay, in our last segment we were looking at chapter 2 and the nature of matter. The particular nature of matter, we looked at the atom and uh, discovered that the elements on the periodic table are each unique kinds of atoms and all the elements are made up, each individual element is made up of only one kind of atom, even though sometimes they appear in different forms, such as the allotropes of carbon. Atoms are similar to the letters in the alphabet in that elements can come together and make up compounds. And then we went into a little bit about the nature of compounds and something unusual, something that is a compound has two different types of atoms whereas there are things called diatomic molecules which are elements and we looked at the periodic table and we were able to identify very quickly what those seven diatomic elements are. So let's just go back there and take a look at those seven diatomics once again. We have hydrogen and then we're going to go over to number seven and draw the number seven in order to identify the other diatomics. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those are our seven diatomic elements. So going back uh, to compounds, we can put compounds or elements into chemical equations and that is analogous to what a sentence would be in English. So let's continue on and we're going to very quickly talk about the three states of matter and we will not explore uh, plasma in this class because chemists don't really concern themselves with plasma. That seems to be the realm of physicists. So we all know the three states of matter as solid, liquid, and gas and I just want to look at them slightly different than perhaps you have before. A solid, is its volume fixed? In other words, does it stay the same? And yes, it does have a fixed volume. And is its shape fixed? For a solid, yes, a shape is fixed in that it does not change or conform to the container in which you put it. A liquid does also have a fixed volume, but its shape conforms to the container into which you put it. So we say no to the fixed shape. And a gas can be compressed, so no, it does not have a fixed volume. That's why you can pump your basketball, your tire, up to a certain pressure is because you're putting more gas into the same space. That's how you increase pressure. And a fixed shape? No, a gas is going to conform to the shape of the container that it is in. So that's a slightly different way of looking at it. What I'd like to do is to have you draw the three different um, states of matter in a little box. So I'm going to put here four boxes. I'm sorry, three boxes because we are not dealing with plasma. And I'm going to draw what these three states of matter would look like. So this is solid, liquid, and gas. And let me pause the video and fill in my picture. Okay, so I have drawn in my three pictures of a solid, a liquid, and a gas. And let me just talk about them for a second here. For a solid, the atoms are very highly organized. They tend to stay together and if I wanted to I could have put them all to the left side of the box and had them make a little wall over here to show that they don't conform to the shape of the container. And in the case of a liquid if you pretend that this is water in a, uh, a pot, let's say, that someone has sloshed it all to the left hand side of the container. And for a gas, the, the molecules or the particles, atoms, are all separate from one another. There's no attraction to each other. So they go anywhere that they want to in that container. But they do fill the whole container. Now, let's move to drawing a picture showing diatomic oxygen as a gas 
and then another picture, water as a solid. Once again, I'll pause while I draw that picture. So here is my little drawing of oxygen as a gas. It's diatomic, so that means that there are two atoms of oxygen in each molecule of oxygen. Remember, it's not a compound, it is an element. And these molecules are able to go anywhere within my container. They fill the container. They're not all packed into one place or another, but they spread out all over. Water, as a solid, if you'll notice, I've put an oxygen atom, that's the bigger circle, with two smaller circles attached to it. Oxygen is one big, and then hydrogens are the two small. And if you'll notice, every big circle has two little circles that are associated with it. But as a solid, all of these are connected to each other. And you notice they're not all over the container. They don't take the shape of the container. They just are sitting in the middle. Imagine an ice cube sitting in a glass of water. So, what can we say about solids? Solids are fixed in position, they are fixed in volume, and they do not um, want to move too much. They're, they're limited in their movement. They can vibrate in place, but they're not able to go anywhere they want to. Liquids, on the other hand, tend to have the ability to move and take the shape of their container they can flow much more freely, so they have more movement as individual atoms. Gases, on the other hand, have a tremendous amount of movement. There's no attraction between one gas molecule and a neighboring one. That's why they don't stick together. Whereas a liquid, there is attraction between the neighboring molecules. So that's a little of the difference between solids, liquids, and gases from an atomic point of view so that we can get a sense of what a chemist thinks of when he says a solid, liquid, and a gas. All right, we're going to talk about physical and chemical properties and physical changes and chemical changes as well. And I want to give you a clear sense of what these uh, words mean. To a chemist, they are very important. When we talk about physical properties, what we're doing is we're describing the characteristics of matter without changing. So we're looking at the characteristics without changing the substance. And so to contrast that, chemical properties is how something reacts or Oops, something reacts or doesn't react. There are some things we really don't want to react, um, and we call them inert substances. Inert substances are good. Uh, for example, when girls get their ears pierced, they do not want the earring interacting with their skin and causing infections or other such problems, so they buy a certain quality of metal, whether that's a 18 karat gold or sterling silver, I believe, is also safe. Don't take my word for it, but that's what I've heard. So, physical properties. Let's look at some things that might be known as physical properties. The melting point of a substance. So, if we're talking about water, water melts at 32 degrees C or zero degrees C. The boiling point, we might also be concerned about something we can measure, such as density, which is a measurement of the mass and the volume of something. Something as simple as color or smell of a substance. These are all physical properties. Chemical properties is how it reacts with something else. Is it flammable? Can it rust? And a chemist would call that oxidation rather than rusting. And there's a number of other types of uh, reactions that something can undergo. So take a look at this list down here below this chart and tell me, 
is it a physical or chemical property for each of these in between the commas? We'll check on your work in class. On to the next page. All right, so what are physical changes and what are chemical changes? When chemists think about physical changes, it is very common that we talk about something such as a change of state. Now, I don't mean going from Illinois to Wisconsin, but I mean going from a solid to a liquid. That is called melting, okay? When you go from a liquid to a solid, the reverse direction is freezing. You could also have condensing, boiling as opposite uh, phenomena. And then a tough one to remember is something called sublimation. Sublimation is going from a solid to a gas. That's what dry ice does. Physical change is also known as dissolving. So if I dissolve salt in water or sugar in water, that is a physical change. It is not a chemical change. In a chemical change, I will start with one thing and I will make something new, something that did not exist beforehand. And this would be a new substance. A sign of that happening is perhaps when you see a color change, but not all color changes are chemical changes. When heat is produced, when two materials interact, that would be called an energy change. We also might have a flow of electricity. And since electricity is just electrons, I will abbreviate electrons in this course as E minus, and the flow of electrons is known as electricity. You might notice it in the form of a new smell occurring when two things are mixed. You might also see a solid form. Be careful there. We might want to look at that. Once we go through these examples in class, you'll be able to see where solids forming might change some of your thinking versus the whole idea of the freezing of a substance. So solids can form when something freezes, but it can also form because of a chemical reaction. So take a try at these. Vinegar and baking soda bubbles. Which of these scrambled eggs do on the grass? Which of those are going to be chemical changes? All right? Now, we're going to talk, um, we're going to leave the, the whole idea of physical changes, chemical changes. We'll do more work in class on those. And talk about matter, the, the material that makes up the entire world. So what we're going to do is we're going to start up at the top. We're going to draw a little diagram of matter and we're going to divide it into two different parts. On the left hand side we're going to write down the word pure substance. If something is not a pure substance then it is going to be a mixture. And mixtures are made up of multiple pure substances. So if I were to take the pure substances that are in the world and break them into their own little categories, I would say that there's only two kinds of pure substances. That would be either an element or a compound. So a pure substance, and there's only two kinds in the whole world, is either an element or a compound. I cannot separate elements. That's the smallest unit of matter that exists. That is unique, let me say, because atoms ultimately are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But a compound contains two or more different elements. So can I separate a compound into elements? And yes, I can. I must perform what is known as a chemical separation. 
a chemical separation means that I am going to break chemical connections or chemical bonds in order to get from the compound to the element. I don't need to do a chemical separation if I'm going to break apart a mixture. But there are two kinds of mixtures and one kind is known as a homogeneous mixture. In chemistry there is a special homogeneous mixture known as a solution. And when we say it's homogeneous that means it is the same from top to bottom. Whatever you have the first drop of something you're gonna have as the very last drop exactly the same. People who produce food substances like homogeneous mixtures because homogeneous mixtures means that first taste of something is going to be the same as that last taste. And in chemistry it's important that we have a homogeneous mixture, a solution, because when you're doing a chemical reaction you want the same concentration of the same substances at the very beginning as you want at the end. The other type of mixture is known as heterogeneous. And heterogeneous means you are likely to have different layers. And those layers may be something as simple as Italian dressing where you see the oil sitting on top of the vinegar. The vinegar sinks to the bottom because it's more dense than the oil which is floating on top. If a bottle says mix before using, that's typical of something that is heterogeneous. It separates into its parts. So heterogeneous is going to have different phases. They can all be liquid phases, but it could also be a liquid and a solid. A heterogeneous mixture of a liquid and a solid would be like sand and water. You could have sand and water combined in your bucket and the water is going to float on top, the sand is going to sink to the bottom. So a heterogeneous mixture has phases and to the naked eye it seems separated but those are not necessarily pure separations. A homogeneous mixture is going to have one phase and it will be all evenly distributed. And that gives you a little idea of how those um, work. So finally, let's look at some examples of mixtures so we can be clear what we're talking about. Solids. We can put together a couple of different metals and we make what is known as an alloy. So if you look at gold, you can buy 24 karat gold, 18 karat gold, or even lower quality. 24 karat is pure gold atoms. 18 karat is a mixture of gold, silver, and copper atoms. You might have also heard of other um, alloys. You might have heard of pewter, which is an alloy of a few different metals. Uh, there's also sterling silver, and we can go on and on with that list of other mixtures of solids that make up a, a metal that is a mixture. Gases, the air that we breathe is a mixture of approximately 80% nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen is diatomic. And it's 20% oxygen, approximately. There's other gases that are in there as well, but those are your two major gases. And you will um, see mixtures of gases in a, a number of different uh, situations in industry where they're trying to produce something. Uh, tap water is an example of a liquid. So tap water is a mixture of water as well as some ions of sodium sometimes. Sometimes you might have tasted a little bit of iron in your water. 
And there's also trace amounts of magnesium ions that are in there. So when I put these little plus signs up there, that means that they are ions and they have a charge to them. Okay? Other liquids that are mixtures, you would uh, say soda or pop, depending upon where you're from, is a mixture of water, carbon dioxide, sugar, flavoring, preservatives. Uh, you would also find milk to be a, uh, a mixture as well of those uh, different uh, substances. So take a look at this list below and why don't you tell me a little bit about them being a mixture and tell me whether it is homogeneous or heterogeneous. So chemists take great delight in um, uh, pure substances and so we're always seeking ways in which we can isolate the pure substance and we've devised a few methods of separating mixtures into their pure substances. So the first one we're going to talk about is when you want to use distillation in order to separate out a substance, you would have a setup something like this here. You would have an impure liquid being boiled and the vapors come into here and they hit the cold water and when they hit the cold water they turn into a liquid and then they drop into the container right there. So cold water is run in order to keep this tube, um, which is a condenser, nice and chilly so that when the hot gases come in here, they do turn into a liquid. Another way is filtration. So we have something in this beaker that we know is impure and we want to purify it. So what we do is we separate the water from the solid by pouring it through a, a paper filter and then we have the nice clean filtrate which you know in this case it looks like it's water. Another method which is really cool and we'll have a chance to do in a lab is to do chromatography. What we do is we take a color, a water soluble color in the examples that we'll do, and we put that on a strip of paper and we cause water to climb up the paper by dipping say the bottom part of this in water and then the water begins to move up the paper and as the water moves up the paper it takes parts of the dyes with it so I actually think this is reversed where they put a, a dot of each of these colors down at this end and they produced these colors going up that way so as they did this they were able to separate out that whatever color that was is and perhaps purple is made up of a red and a blue this green is made up of yellow and blue and this maroon has a little bit of blue mixed in with a red in order to get that color so these are three different ways of separating mixtures and those are all physical means of separating mixtures. If we want to use a chemical means of separation, tell me what is the original starting substance for this? Well, that's the end of your chapter two notes. Thanks for your attention.